Okay. All right. Uh, good morning to all of you. Got a lot of you. You'll see in your seats. There's a lot of. Um, we get a lot of pictures and charts today because we're going to. This morning we're going to do a study. Uh, Exodus chapter 25, uh, at least uh, the first two, 22 verses of the chapter, and it concerns itself with the tabernacle. So I think we're gonna, you're going to really enjoy it. Um, a lot of things about the tabernacle that I think are going to really you're going to find interesting. It's going to tell us about tells us a little bit about what heaven looks like. It tells us what uh, a lot about Christ, and it tells us uh, the tabernacle is a type of uh, typ- typifies us, the believers, individuals, and the church. So there's a lot of things with the tabernacle. I think you, I don't know if you've ever heard things taught on the tabernacle, but it teaches it, it teaches us a lot about the person of Christ, about ourselves, about the church, and about heaven. So uh, this will be our subject here this morning. So there's a lot of charts and pictures about the tabernacle and different things. So I think you're going to enjoy it. So. Uh, if uh, if you could turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. Thank you for those. Uh, we received the money for the video equipment. It was like 400-something bucks or whatever it was, 500 bucks, for the video equipment. And uh, so that came in. So uh, we're going to, uh, Titus will be ordering that material uh, this week. And uh, so thank you for all those who uh, contributed to it. You can pick up the book, Cheyenne. Everybody, you know what Cheyenne's middle name is? Autumn. Isn't that a great middle name? I love that. That's a great middle name. She could be Cheyenne Autumn Thompson, and I'm a country singer. I don't know. I'll be your manager, okay? Now she's all embarrassed. Look at it. So anyways, uh, if uh, also we're going to, uh, just a reminder, uh, our class schedule is uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evenings uh, from 7 to 8 on Thursday evening after class. We have our prayer meeting. Uh, also, uh, remember, t- after today we have our if anybody who's listening to our voice or on the website and they are in the area, uh, we have, uh, if you, you can come and visit us. If you just contact us um, through the website, we have, uh, you can get my email addresses. There's a phone number to contact us there if you want to uh, get in touch. We're meeting Titus Thompson, Jody uh, Thompson's home, so we don't really like to put you know, the address out there on the website. You, know, you never know who's out there, crazy people. So if, you wanna, if you're interested in coming in and seeing us, uh, here in the teaching live face to face, you can uh, give us a buzz and we'll set you up. Also, after class, we have our, uh, we have a uh, Jody put prepares and the girls prepare a uh, what do you call it um, a brunch after you call it or a buffet or something like that. What's that? A feast, a feast. That's why you notice that you know we're kind of like plump in this ministry. So, um, also uh, an interesting Bill McMurray, uh, our own Bill McMurray, uh, former Marine, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, he uh, he did uh, apple crisp for us today. So Bill makes a mean apple crisp. You did this before, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so that uh, so if you're in the area, duty. what's that? Well, kitchen, duty. kitchen duty. Yeah. Well, when he drove up, it was kind of funny. When he drove up and he, they had the van there, I said, "Why is Bill sitting in the back seat? Is it, did did Crystal get mad at him? <laughs> did Crystal get mad at him and uh, said, go back, Dan? I want to talk to you.' Or did you know did he hurt himself at work? I'm like, geez, I'm waiting to say, oh, geez, I hope he didn't come out with crutches, you know, and he's in the back." But he was all right. I guess, you know, he said, I couldn't stand her anymore. I had to go in the back. That's why he probably isn't. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we have a, a lot of ground to cover today. We have, that's going to be a fun subject. So without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer. And uh, of course, uh, I'm going to always, you might always say, uh, why do you always talk to us about confession of sin at the beginning and everything? And uh, Titus and I were talking about this the other night, and he reminded me there's a lot of people on Pal Talk. Or not pal, well, at pal talk at times that might never have been exposed to our teaching, or go through the website and visit our ministry, and they don't know these things. So I can't take for granted uh, that these things that everybody knows what I'm about to say to you now, which is before we hear the teaching of the Word of God, before we worship in Bible class, before we sing, before we give, before we learn, teach, we have to be filled with the Spirit. And in order to ensure the fact that we're in fellowship with God and therefore filled with the Spirit. We need to apply 1 John 1, 9, which states, If we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And uh, each and every wrongdoing purifies us. That means uh, He conf- uh, cleanses us, purifies us from the sins that we commit that we don't know that we're committing because of ignorance to the Word of God. Now, this is important. Even though you received the forgiveness of your sins at the moment of your uh, salvation, the moment of conversion, when you trusted in Jesus as your Savior, 
You might ask yourself, why do I have to confess my sins now? Well, it's all about fellowship. Uh, You were entered into the family of God at the moment of your conversion when you trusted in Jesus as your Savior. Now you're in his family. However, just like in our, like in my home when I was growing up, if I was in the family and if I sinned against my parents and disobeyed them, uh, I wasn't kicked out of the family or disowned, although they might have thought about doing that. They, I was uh, out of fellowship with them and I was sent to my bed. So the, uh, in the same way, when we, uh, when we sin against the, our Heavenly Father, uh, we're out of fellowship and therefore we need to do confess the sin, and then do what he tells us to do. Obedience is the key to staying in fellowship. So when we confess the sin, now we're brought back into fellowship with our Heavenly Father, and then uh, we stay in fellowship by obeying the Spirit, His Spirit, who speaks to us through His Word, the teaching of the Word of God. So this is very, very important because uh, you can understand the Bible in some spots uh, uh, intellectually, uh, and, but you're not going to hear what the Spirit says, and you're not going to be conformed to the image of, of Jesus Christ. See, the key thing about uh, when we come to Bible class, it's to be transformed into the image of Christ, not to be conformed to, what, uh, to religion or some kind of do's and don'ts. Uh, it's all about a relationship with God and becoming more and more like Jesus Christ in our thoughts and our words and our actions. And that can't take place if we're out of fellowship with God. So, uh, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you at this time, do what First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with that being said, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, another beautiful day out here in Iowa. We thank you for the mild winter. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings that we have in the temporal realm and providing for us logistically everything that we need in life, food, shelter, and clothing, homes uh, to uh, live in, jobs to go to, businesses. We thank you, Father, also for the body of Christ and that we can assemble with other believers to worship you and your Son. We thank you for the gift of your Son and his work on the cross, which makes it all possible to have fellowship with you and each other. We thank you, Father, for his willingness to become a man and to die for the sins of the world. And we just thank you for raising him from the dead on the third day for our justification and to give us a guarantee of a resurrection body. We thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, from regeneration to resurrection. And we thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit in inspiring the scriptures and making the scriptures understandable to us. Thank you, Father, for the the completed canon of Scripture, and we know that we're truly a privileged people, that even in the Old Testament, they didn't have this complete revelation as we do here in the 21st century. We thank you, Father, for the Thompsons opening up their homes so that we could teach on a daily basis. We also thank you for those who are assembled here this morning that are serious about the teaching of the Word of God and are interested in growing in their relationship with you and learning your Word. We thank you for each and every individual here in the Thompson household, and also those who are brothers and sisters in Christ who are faithful also on the, uh, through Pal Talk. We thank you for each and every one of them, and those who will be uh, viewing or listening to this class at a later date through our, our website. We thank you for each and every one of them. We lift up, at this particular time, we lift up Sandy Valentine. We pray that she would heal her of her pneumonia, and we just pray, Father, that you would bring her and Doug uh, safely back uh, to us. We also uh, lift up other individuals in our ministry that might be having problems with uh, illnesses, and we pray that you would give them healing. Father, we also pray this morning that you would help the communicator to deliver your, to your full counsel to your people, that the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through him, that uh, he would communicate your word with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power. We pray that those in the audience would be uh, concentrating help this, uh, through the Spirit, help them to concentrate and to understand and put into practice application, your word, that will be taught here this morning. We also pray that you give Titus and Tyler wisdom doing the sound and the recordings. We pray that we be no problems with the technology, and we thank you for their service in this area of the ministry. And Father, we just also pray that you would, uh, we'd have a great time also singing in the, in the song service and, uh, and, and everything that goes on here this morning, the fellowship that the Spirit would empower it all and that we'd have a great time growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, worshiping you and your Son, and also bringing glory to you and your Son. 
So, Father, we pray for these people and things. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Could you all rise, please? We're going to do uh, a song called Ancient of Days on page 13. Page 13 of your songbooks, it's called Ancient of Days. Now, you're probably wondering, what, what am I putting on here? But that's, it's not a radio program or something like that. It's actually my monitor, so I can actually hear what I'm singing with the mix. All right, Ancient of Days, page 13. Ready. Blessing and honor, glory and power unto the ancient of days from every nation born of creation bow before the ancient of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you be exalted O God and your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation born of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne and worship. You'll be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days For none can compare to your matchless worth Sing unto the ancient of days Every tongue in heaven and earth Shall declare your glory Every knee shall bow at your throne In worship you'll be exalted, O oh God and your kingdom shall not pass away Oh, ancient of days Ancient of days Ancient of days you may be seated, my children. Tyler is whispering in my ear through the headphones, Sing better! <laughs> That's the kind of kid he is. You're off key! He's a mean kid, I just want you to know that. He's, uh, he likes to, uh, one of these days he's going to give his father a heart attack by scaring him. See, he, when he comes, dad comes in the house, Tyler's over in Cheyenne, always trying to scare him. And that's what they do to me too. So today... I got, I got him good the other night. I got Tyler good the other night. Remember I told you, he's like Cato. I'm a Cato in Pink Panther. Jumps out of the woodwork, you know. So I, I'm coming in the house the other night, teach Thursday night, and oh, we, we're getting ready for the prayer meeting, and he, he ran upstairs to do something. So he comes back down. I go, he comes around the corner. Boom, I got him. He goes, ah! And he was like, you know, practically crying. And I was like, don't, don't cry. So anyways, see, I get the microphone. You don't. So anyways, uh, so today he, I'm, dry, I'm walking up, coming into the place, and he thinks he's going to scare me because... He's in the back of the truck. So he's laying down the back of the truck. So he comes over and he goes, boo! He jumps out of the thing. I go, I just go like this. Like I, you know, like, like I didn't, like I didn't, like I, like I knew he was there, which I didn't really know he was there. He was a, so anyways, so he's like, he's real like, all proud of himself. And I'm trying not to get, let him get too uh, happy about it. Like, you know, you didn't really get me. You didn't scare me. So anyway, so that's what goes on here. Say a prayer for us. Say a prayer for us that we can persevere through all this 
this crazy kid here. He's doing a great job over there, doing the sound with his dad. All right, uh, if you haven't, uh, enough of that, let's turn to Exodus chapter 25, verse 1, if you haven't gone there already. Uh, Exodus chapter 25, verse 1, we have a lot, of, a lot of ground to cover here, people. We have a lot of, you have a, a lot of pictures and charts in front, uh, with you in, this, in your seats, and uh, this is, uh, uh, we've got a lot of uh, visual aids in this particular class here this morning. We're going to study this morning Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 22. We couldn't take the whole chapter in one day, it just... Too much information and, and to shove into one class, so I, I broke it out into two different classes. Now, in verses 1 through 22 of Exodus chapter 25, we have the Lord giving Moses instructions regarding donations for the construction of the tabernacle and the ark, and also instructions with regards to the use of the ark. Now, the subject of Exodus chapter 25 is the tabernacle, and in particular, the articles that are in the tabernacle. Uh, this tabernacle uh, symbolized God's uh, dwelling among his people, and it was the place where the Lord met the leaders of the Israelites and also met Moses. And that's why Moses calls it in some parts of uh, Exodus the tent of meeting, because that's where he met God, and the Israelites met him. Now, as I said uh, bri uh, briefly at the, before we had our opening prayer, uh, we're going to find out in this study of the tabernacle, which is going to take us several weeks, uh, several chapters, it's talked about this particular uh, uh, piece of a uh, place of where the Israelites worship the Lord. The tabernacle symbolizes or typifies four different, at least four different things. First of all, it represents heaven. It represents heaven where God dwells. So uh, if we want, if you, in the future, if we ever teach on heaven, or if you ever do, if somebody, uh, when we teach on the subject of heaven, like a topical study of heaven, we've taught on heaven before, but you'd have to include this study of the tabernacle because the tabernacle is actually a picture of how heaven where the ark uh, the mercy seat as a picture of the divine throne, of God's throne in heaven. Also, uh, the tabernacle is also a picture of the person and work of Jesus Christ. The ark is actually a picture of the person of Jesus Christ, meaning it, 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 it talks about, it typifies the fact that he's both God and man. It's also a picture of the believer. Remember Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that don't you know that you, to the Corinthians that you are the temple of God. So the, ta the, the tabernacle is also tells us something about ourselves. It's also a picture of the church. It also typifies the church. That's according to 1 Timothy 3.15, Hebrews 3.6, and Hebrews 10.21. So look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me. From, from every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. This is the contribution which you are to raise from then. When I say contribution here, he says that, it's like we take up an offering. Then he goes on to say, in verse 3, he said, this is the contribu contribution which you would erase from them, the Israelites. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, porpoise skins, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastpiece. Let them construct the sanctuary for me. That's talking about the tabernacle. That I may dwell among them. This is one of the themes of the Bible is God wants to dwell with his people. If you read Revelation, read the last two chapters of Revelation 21 and 22, God dwells with his people. That's what he's always wanted to do. He indwells us right now as believers. Remember, we've studied that many times in the past. The Spirit indwells us, Romans 8, 11, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. The Son does, Colossians 1, 27. The Father does, he, Ephesians 4, 5. And there are many other passages which teach this. So God wants to dwell with his people. Yes, Tony? Well, in the beginning, he dwelt with Adam and Eve in the garden. Right, exactly. In fact, that's almost, a, uh, there's, a, there's a, another guy out there named Randall Price who's done work on that about the fact that even from the Garden of Eden, there's God's, uh, God has wanted to dwell with his people, and that's what he did with Adam and Eve. So this is the theme of the Bible. God wants to dwell. One of the themes of the Bible is God wants to dwell with his people. Now look at verse 8. It says, Let them construct a sanctuary for, me, sanctuary for me in order that I may dwell among them according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. Now, this, these verses, these opening verses, the first nine verses of the chapter, record the Lord, as we see, instructing Moses to go to the Israelites and take up a voluntary offering for him in order that, uh, to procure materials 
for the building of the tabernacle. Now, notice the Lord says that this offering was for him, even though the offering was to procure material for the building of the tabernacle. And that makes clear to us that the tabernacle was symbolically God's dwelling among the Israelites, thus intrinsically his property. And so this is very important. So verse 2, if you notice, he says in verse 2, tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me, an offering for me, from every man, and this is key, whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. So that verse is teaching a basic principle of giving, namely that the offerings for the Lord or offerings we, we present to the Lord are to be voluntary and spontaneous, which is emphasized in 1 Chronicles 29, 5, 1 Corinthians 9, 17, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, 1 Peter 5, 2. All these things emphasize the voluntary nature of the offering. Now remember, we just saw that God's asking the Israelites to raise a contribution for the, for the, to procure materials to build the tabernacle. Now, uh, that, means, that means that this uh, tabernacle is symbolically God's property. It's God's property in essence because he's asking the Israelites to uh, pro, uh, give up an offering, uh, present an offering w- to procure the materials for the building of this, offer, uh, this tabernacle. And so therefore, it's the Lord's property. So uh, there's a principle here. Like for instance, when you give, when you give to this ministry, you're giving the ministry because it's the Lord, it's, his word is being taught here. Uh, for, you should never give to a ministry unless it's teaching the gospel. And that's very important. So uh, it, it's his word that I'm teaching. And it's his word that you're giving for the propagation of. And so that's important. So it's, it's very, uh, the principle like Israel, it's the, God's tabernacle. So God said, take up an offering. But the, uh, the ta- the, by giving for the tabernacle, they're actually giving to God. So that's why when you give to this ministry, for the word, you're actually giving it to God and for his word to be taught. So uh, this is very important that we see it's voluntary. Uh, tithing is mentioned by some people, but that was a form of taxation in Old Testament Israel. But we don't see that in the church age. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, key passage on giving. Jesus taught this. It had nothing to do with the percentage. You could, according to the, uh, God and what these passages are teaching us, 2 Corinthians 9 the Lord's uh, taught on giving to in the Sermon on the Mount, you could give as much as you desire. I mean, he commended the woman for giving all of her living. Remember that? The, wo- the widow's might. So there's a, 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 the percentage is, that's fine if you want to, uh, you should uh, put aside a certain percentage of your earnings that God gives you. But uh, ultimately, it's got to be voluntary. It's got to be free will. It can't be uh, given out of manipulation. Uh, you know, you see this going on in churches today. They'll put, they'll put the, uh, how much people are giving on the wall of the church. That's manipulating people. Basically, to shame them into giving, and you shouldn't do that. It should be, they should be giving because they want to give. Because they, 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 so that's why in this ministry, we take up an offering and we give it, you know, it might say some things about what it says about giving, but ultimately... I can't go knocking on anybody's door, nor would I ever. Uh, it's about giving. If, either, if, if people uh, are moved by the Spirit to give, then they give. And if they don't, they don't. And if they don't, you shut the doors or you do something else, you know. But if they support it, they, God will support it through his people. But this is what, it's all about voluntary offerings here is what he's mentioning here. The Israelites got to do this because they're moved in their heart to do so. So in these verses, verses 1 through 9, the Lord specifies exactly what he wants from the Israelites. The four metals to be used in the construction of the tabernacle uh, were gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, And the materials to be used in the construction were blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and fine linen, as well as goat hair, if you notice, ram skins dyed red, porpoise skins, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and setting stones for the ephod and the breastpiece for the, uh, for the, uh, the high priest in Israel. Now, the materials for the tabernacle are car- categorized according to type. First, the metals are mentioned in verse 3. Then the fabrics, if you notice, are listed in verse 4. Then the skins and the wood are mentioned in verse 5, verse five and this is followed by the lamp oil and the fragrant anointing oil ingredients mentioned in verse 6. In verse 7, we have the, uh, the, the stones, the breastpiece, and the ephod of the high priest mentioned in verse 7. Now, the metals and, that are mentioned in verse 3, with gold, silver, and bronze, would be used for covering 
the wooden framework of the tabernacle and for covering the altars, the table, and the ark. All of this is going to be used. Some would be used for the solid gold rings that held the ark poles, that's in verse 12, and some gold plates, dishes, bowls, and pitchers, and the lampstand, as well as the mercy seat on the ark. Now, the fabrics would be used for the curtains. There were curtains in the tabernacles, we'll see. They're mentioned in detail in chapter 26. Also, the, the fabrics would be used for the garments of the high priest. We'll see that in chapter 28 of the book of Exodus. Now, the skins would serve to shield the tabernacle from the elements. So it had to be protected from the elements so the, we would see that the animal skins would be used to do this. The wood would be used for the framework for anything that needed to have strong spans, such as the rafters of the tabernacle, the table, the altar services, the legs for the ark, the table and the altar. Now, the oil would be used as the fuel for the oil lamps of the tabernacle. The oil is actually a picture of the Holy Spirit And when we get to that. Also, uh, remember that oil would be used for the fuel for the, o the oil lamps of the tabernacle lampstand the menorah, as well as the main ingredient, main ingredient of the anointing oil, which would were to be used on a regular basis by the priests. Now, the incense was, a compounded, was compounded into a formula for the exclusive use of the tabernacle from the ingredients donated by the Israelites. The precious stones, the gemstones, would adorn part of the ephod as well as the breastpiece of the high priest. Now, if you see in your Bible, uh, your, your, there's a picture there, of an individual and it has a breast piece and it has a picture a, an artist's a recreation of what these stones would have looked like they were over the heart of the high priest each of the stones would represent one of the tribes of the nation of israel and they were and when they were symbolically brought into the presence of the lord regularly by the high priest they would represent these 12 tribes and they would be over his heart meaning that God, they were close to God's heart, that they were, uh, he, cared and he had a care and concern for the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's what those, those uh, the, the breast piece, breast pieces, uh, the breast piece, uh, plate, breast piece of the, uh, the ephod for the high priest in Israel, that's what it would look like. So the, the gemstones or the onyx stones, the, the stones that they would give in this offering, the Israelites would contribute to making this ephod and the breast piece for the high priest. Now, the materials listed here in verses 1 through 9 would not normally be owned by slaves. Remember, the Israelites were in Egypt were slaves, but they left Egypt, and according to the Lord's promise, and so you wouldn't expect slaves, which the Israelites were in Egypt, to have such valuable commodities. Because if you look at it, Gold, silver, bronze, blue, scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair, ram skin dyed red, porpoise skin, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, verse 7, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastpiece. That's some serious cash there. There's some serious uh, value there in these things. So you wouldn't expect these high cost luxury items to be uh, ha uh, in the possession of the Israelites who were formerly slaves in Egypt. They wouldn't have been available to the Israelites while living in Goshen as slaves. Now, does anybody remember how they got these things, yep. Tony? When they left Egypt, yep. the, I believe the Lord commanded Pharaoh to turn loose of those things, didn't they? The, the Egyptian people wanted them to leave, so they paid them. <clears throat> well, yeah, basically. Basically, they, they wanted them, because of all the, all the other plagues, they, they wanted them gone. So they basically <coughs> gave them you leave town. They paid them off to get out of town. Exactly. That's exactly. They paid, the Israelites uh, got, received all these things from the Egyptians because God actually predicted this, that they would, uh, they would, uh, you would plunder the Egyptians and without ra raising an arrow or shooting an arrow or raising a, 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 a stick in violence, they would be uh, given to them. They would pay them basically to get out of town is what it was. So here, in Exodus 25, we have the Lord inviting the Israelites to contribute a portion of the items they received from the Egyptians in order to construct a dwelling place for himself. Now, as we mentioned, Tony alluded to this, in Exodus 12, verses 35 and 36, that records the fulfillment of a prophecy the Lord made in Exodus 3, 21 and 22. What's that? That the Israelites would find favor with the Egyptian people because of the plagues so that the former, the Egyptian people, 
of the Israelites uh, would uh, not leave Egypt empty-handed. So God said in Exodus 3, 21 through 22, before the plagues happened, before he went to Pharaoh, God, Moses went to Pharaoh and Aaron, he said, you're going to plunder the Egyptians. They're going to pay you all these things because you're going to find favor in the people and they're not going to be too happy with their Pharaoh. So Exodus 12, 35 and 36 records the fulfillment of that prediction by the Lord and they plundered the Egyptians without even going to battle against them because they were found favor in the sight of the Egyptian people. Now, if you look at Exodus 25, 8, it says, let them construct a sanctuary for me in order that I may dwell among them. Now that verse, the Lord tells Moses that these materials that uh, the Lord wants to be procured to build a tabernacle for him were to be used by the Israelites in constructing a sanctuary for him to dwell among them. It must be emphasized that the Lord was, uh, you've got to remember this, he's not demanding this of them that they build this dwelling for him because they were to donate materials on a voluntary basis only which indicates that the Lord didn't want to dwell with the Israelites unless they invited him. This is one of the things about God. He's a gentleman. If you don't want to study his word as a believer, he ain't going to hold a gun to your head. You might might get disciplined at some point because you're his child, but he's a gentleman. And uh, so that's very important. We see this about God. He wants them to do it of their own free will, we would say, voluntary. So he is not demanding this of them. He, because he's asking this, uh, a voluntary uh, donation to be taken up. So the Lord, remember, he doesn't need the building. God doesn't need the building because he's everywhere present. There's not a place in creation where God is not. So God is everywhere present, so he doesn't need the dwelling place, but he does desire in, uh, in, with the, uh, to dwell with the Israelites. So he would not dwell with them unless they invited him by building a dwelling place for him according to his requirements. In fact, actually, because God is everywhere present, what God is actually doing here is he's condescending to us, not in a negative sense like we say someone he's condescending. Well, God, when God condescends, it's justified and legitimate because he's God. But because he's everywhere present and we're finite creatures, he goes down to our level. He become he he he'll he'll he'll, uh, uh, he'll, uh, uh, he'll adjust himself to the sense uh, he will live with them, he will dwell with them and it was in a fashion where they could comprehend it and, and, built, and having this tabernacle would be a, to, according to their, the Israelites' frame of reference. And it's interesting, you know, God the Son became a human being. You know, I mean, he, he condescended to the, to the human race because he wants to dwell with his people and among his people. Now in Exodus 25, 9, look at verse 9. It says, according to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so... Moses, you shall construct it. So verse 9, we have the Lord emphasizing that this sanctuary must be built according to the specifications that he prescribed. That he prescribed. And Exodus chapters 35 through 40 presents Moses carefully executing the divine plans in Exodus 25, 10 through uh, 10, all the way to Exodus 27, 21, as well as Exodus 30, chapter 30, verses 1 through 6, give the reader details of those directions. So again, chapters 35 through 40 of the book of Exodus present Moses carefully executing the plans that God gave to him, which are found in Exodus 25, 10 to Exodus 27, 21 and Exodus 30, one through six. Now it's very important here. It's a principle here. I brought it out in the past. God says, he's telling, this is how I want it done. He also tells them how he wants to be worshiped. This is something us Christians need to get into our heads. God says, obey my word and do what I say here. This is how I want my tabernacle to be. This is how I want uh, want it to be. This is how I want you to worship me. As we'll see as we get further, he gets to the details regarding the worship that will be in the tabernacle. So notice something. It's everything in order to be pleasing to him has got to be according to his word. Thus, us as Christians, if we want to worship God, we're to worship him as Jesus said, by means of spirit and truth, not by our own design, how we want to do it. We, a lot of Christians do that, who call themselves Christians, and they are, but they don't worship according to the word of God. They don't conduct their churches according to the t- teaching of the word of God, and they don't live their lives according to the word of God. Instead, they use, live their lives according to philosophy or psychology or humanistic thinking or whatnot. And that's not the way it should be as, uh, for us Christians. If, the worship, if we, God's going to accept our worship, 
It has to be according to spirit and truth. His spirit and his truth. Very important. So everything that goes on here is got to be done according to how God prescribes it, not according to the imaginations of the Israelites. Religion is uh, Satan's ace trump. And people who, who are uh, today, maybe in churches today, and they're not worshiping according to spirit and truth, according to God's words. So it would be almost uh, equivalent to the Israelites saying, ah, oh, I'm going to go and build a tabernacle any old way I want. We'll worship the Lord any old way we want. We'll offer any kind of sacrifices the way we want. That's the idea. That's what Christians do today in our own day. Yes, Tony. Well, and it's, it's, it's man-made traditions. Many man-made right. traditions. You're seeing it right now in the time where we're coming close to Easter. Yep. Many man-made traditions follow to do this right. and do that and go to this class and take this right. time out and go here and go there. And it's, yeah, it's well, and that's, and that's very, because what happens here, Israel, what happened later on in their history, they fell away from God's word. And then they had, we see in the gospels, the Pharisees, and Jesus condemned them for this in Mark 7. He says, you obey the traditions of men. You put aside the word of God, the teaching of the word of God for your traditions. Well, Israel ended up drifting away from that. And actually the church has followed Israel's uh, 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 bad example and has drifted away from the teaching of the word of God. Therefore, their worship is nothing but a hollow worship that's not accepted by God. It's all religion. It's a facade. It's hypocrisy. And that's not the way it should be. So we see here, uh, and if it's interesting, in Hebrews, as we compare these first nine verses of Exodus 25, if you notice, actually in verse nine, he says, according to all that I'm going to show you, then he says, as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. Now, Hebrews 8, 5, which I'm going to take you there in a moment, makes clear that the pattern mentioned here in verse 9 indicates that the tabernacle that the Lord wants the Israelites to build for him was to be a copy or a replica of the heavenly tabernacle, which is located in the third heaven and was created before the foundation of the world. Thus, the reason why the Lord demanded that the Israelites follow precisely his instructions, and don't miss this, why did he want Moses to precisely follow his instruction? Because he wanted to produce in the Israelites a desire for heaven as well as a confident expectation of heaven and was to produce a desire in them to live with God forever. So when he says, follow the pattern, the pattern means that this tabernacle that he was supposed to, the Israelites were to build for the Lord on earth was to be a replica of the one in heaven. And why would God want them to do this? Because he was trying to get, producing them a desire for heaven, to want to be with him forever, heaven, uh, in heaven forever. That's what Paul says similar in Philippians chapter three. We're citizens of heaven. We shouldn't be loving the things of this world. We should be eagerly anticipating living with the Lord in heaven. Wherever Jesus is, that's heaven for us. So we see that we're supposed to, uh, God wants to produce in the Israelites this desire for heaven. So hold your place. Look at Hebrews chapter 8. Look at Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 1. Before James. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now the main point and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest, Jesus Christ, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty, that's the Father, in the heavens a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, not the copy which Moses was going to build, build, but the true one, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also must have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. Now, look what he says about this who serve a, serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you 
on the mountain. That's also, uh, that's, he's quoting from Exodus 25, 40, and a portion of that is also mentioned in verse 9. He says, follow the pattern. So we see here that God wanted to do, to tell him to do he's telling Moses to do this because, first of all, he wants him to make a replica of the, of the tabernacle in heaven that God made, but also he's trying to produce in the Israelites a desire to want to be with him in heaven, to, be, uh, to go to heaven, to, to uh, not be in love with the things of the world, but to be with him in the heavenly tabernacle. Now, it's also something is, uh, interesting. In Hebrews 9, 11 and 12, those verses teach us that there is a tabernacle in heaven, as this one just did, which teach that Jesus Christ entered into this tabernacle in heaven upon his ascension and session at the right hand of the Father. These two verses in Hebrews 9 teach that he, the Lord entered by means of his substitutionary spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, which are referred to by the phrase, his blood. So go to Hebrews 9. Look at verse, uh, let's see, I'll tell you in a sec what verse I want you to go. Yeah, look at verse 11, Hebrews 9, 11. It says in Hebrews 9, 11, and in this, in this chapter, uh, the writer is comparing the old covenant with the new covenant. He says in verse 11, but when Christ appeared, verse 11, as a high priest of the good things to come, look what it says. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. See, the one that t- talked about in Exodus, that tabernacle was of this creation. Then he says, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, speaking of his spiritual and physical deaths on the cross, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So what I'm telling you is this, is that what we're learning about the tabernacle in Exodus 25, and we'll learn about it in chapter 26 and chapter 27, is that it's a picture of heaven. The ark is a picture of the throne room of throne of God. Uh, the oh, the whole the whole thing is is a picture of that. Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father. He he offered he cut, he went into the most holy place where to, by by means of what his own death on the cross. So that death is pictured with the blood was uh, sprinkled by the the high priest on the day of atonement on the mercy seat, the lid of the uh, the ark of the covenant. And he would. That's a picture of his death on the cross. The brazen altar that's out in the uh, uh, out in the ta- in the courtyard is a picture of the cross, as we'll say. The animal sacrifices were a picture of Jesus Christ. All these have t- uh, typify uh, have t- uh, different types about Christ. So the the, the tabernacle is going to tell us a lot about heaven, about the work of Christ, and the person of Christ. And I think you'll really enjoy it. Now, interestingly, there are several articles. You can go back to Exodus twenty-five, please. If you could, Exodus 25, verse 10. Interestingly, there are several articles of furniture within the tabernacle which are described in verses 10 through 40 of Exodus 25 before the tabernacle itself is mentioned. So don't miss this. Today, what we're going to see, we're going to start talking first about the articles that are in the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant to start with. And then he mentions the lampstand. He mentions the, he mentions the table of showbread. He mentions these different things before he even mentions the tabernacle itself. And the reason for this is, is that these articles are greater in, are in, are have greater importance because the tabernacle serve to protect the articles of, of, that are in uh, of furniture that are found in the tabernacle. So he, what I'm saying, telling you is this. He starts off talking about the articles, the different furniture in the tabernacle, before he talks about the structure of the tabernacle itself, because the tabernacle is simply the serving as the protection for these articles of furniture that we'll see. So the most important piece of furniture, people, in the tabernacle is mentioned first, which is the ark. So you have another picture. It's a picture of the tabernacle. It's an, a mock-up, an artist's rendering of it. And if you notice... It has a, a it has a, a a numbering system there. So, like for instance, number one, uh, it says the holy of holies. That's where the the only piece of furniture in the holy of holies was the ark. Then there was what we call the uh, that was called the most holy place. There was the holy holy the holy of holies was outside of it where you had the lampstand. You had the the table of showbread. So again, the most holy place is where number two the ark is. Okay. That's the most holy place they would call it. The Holy of Holies contained that place as well as the, the, the next room adjacent to it. And the next room is the Holy of Holies. 
And that contains the, uh, the lampstand. It also contained the altar of incense. The veil was there, which is a picture of Jesus Christ uh, in his human nature. Remember that and when he died, the temple was torn from top to bottom. That, was, uh, that, that veil is a picture of Jesus Christ in his humanity. The, the, uh, the table of showbread, Jesus Christ is the bread, uh, uh, the, the bread of life. And there's other things related to that. So all that is in the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies had one little room. Uh, had a, uh, there were two rooms that made up the Holy of Holies. The room that had just the ark and then the other room beside it, adjacent to it, that had the altar of incense, the lampstand, and the table of showbread. Now, uh, we see that if you look, if you go further outside, you see the brazen altar in the middle of the courtyard. Okay? That's a picture of the cross. See, if you notice something, in order to get to the most holy place, you had to come through the, the, uh, the, the brazen altar, the cross, which tells us that to approach God, you couldn't approach him and enter the holy of holies in the most holy place without a sacrifice. So it was a picture of, in order how to get saved, you had to get through the sacrifice. You had to go, you had to offer a sacrifice. Also, with fellowship is concerned, once you're in the family of God, again, you can't have fellowship with God and enter the holy of place and the most holy place without the merits of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. It's always Christ's death on the cross is the only reason why we can have fellowship with God and enter the most holy place in the Holy of Holies. So in actuality, to, to be in fellowship with God is to enter the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. So we see here that there's, there's the, the tabernacle. We'll be referring to this as we go further along. So keep this handy. And uh, so this is, this, is the, this is the tabernacle, which again, is, uh, is, it's an artist's mock-up. But it has, uh, it's, a, it has a, it's a picture of the work of Christ and the person of Christ. It's a picture of heaven. It's also a picture of the believer and also the church. Now look at Exodus 25.10, please. Exodus 25.10. Exodus 25.10. They, God continuing to talk to Moses, giving him his instructions... Exodus 25.10, they, the Israelites, shall construct an ark of acacia wood. We'll talk about what that is. It found, was found in the Sinai area. It was a very strong, sturdy wood. And it's, it was supposed to be two and a half cubits long. Uh, and uh, we would say three, foot, three, feet, uh, three feet, nine inches. I think the best translation for uh, this chapter, I think, is the Net Bible because they bring out all these... They bring it into English or our modern uh, me- t- uh, terms of measurement. So the, when it says the, uh, the ark isn't, uh, you should construct the ark of acacia wood two and a half cubits long. That's equivalent to three feet nine inches. And then it says, and it's supposed to, and that's three three feet nine inches long. And then it was the the width of it was supposed to be one and a half cubits wide. That would be equivalent to two feet three inches. And then it was supposed to be one and a half cubits high. That would be two feet three inches. As well. Now he says in verse 11, You shall overlay it with gold. That speaks of the deity of Christ. The ark is a picture of Christ. Inside and out, you're to do this. And you shall overlay it. And you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet. And two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the holes, uh, the poles, excuse me, into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. That's the testimony is the Ten Commandments that were put on stone. You shall make a mercy seat. That's the, a picture of the throne of God, which was a throne of judgment prior to the death of Christ. Now it's the throne of grace. So he says, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Paul makes allusion to the mercy seat in Romans 3.25. Then he, goes, he says in verse 17, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, that's three feet, nine inches, and one and a half cubits wide, that's two feet, three inches. You shall make two cherubim of gold. They depict the righteousness and justice of God, or in other words, the integrity of God. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub, at one end, and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings 
facing one another. And the faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat, looking down at it. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, so it's a lid. And the ark you shall put, and in the ark you shall put the testimony, the Ten Commandments, which I will give you. There I will meet with you, have fellowship with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Now, there's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. I have several pictures of the Ark of the Covenant. And disregard the, uh, the, uh, the dimensions that they list in this uh, particular, um, particular picture of the covenant. It's actually, uh, instead of four feet long, remember, it's three feet, nine inches long, and two feet, three inches wide and high. So ignore those dimensions that are in that picture there. But you notice it's, uh, the Ark of the, uh, how it looks. It's, uh, it, would, it would be carried with poles, okay? Uh, so this, is, uh, this particular Ark of the Covenant was known by different names. For instance, as you see in the picture, in 1 Samuel 4.2, it's called the Ark of God. It was also in Psalm 132.8 called the Ark of God's Strength and Ark of the Testimony in Exodus chapter 30, verse 6. Now, what about this word Ark? This is, in the, in the Hebrew, the word is Aron. And this is the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle is the ark and it was this it was uh, the most important and sacred object of Israel's worship and it was made of acacia wood two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits broad and one and a half cubits high and it was plated inside and out with pure gold or in other words it was three feet inches uh, three feet nine inches long and two feet three inches wide and high so that's the ark and this running around each side of the ark was a gold border I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute. It extended above the top of the ark so as to keep the lid from moving. And this lid was called the mercy seat. Very big in theology because it's a picture of propitiation. It's it's a picture of the death of Christ. The blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat by the high priest on the day of atonement. He would sprinkle that mercy, uh, blood on the mercy, mercy seat, the blood of the animal. And it was a picture of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. In fact, the mercy seat is a picture of Jesus Christ as, as a propitiatory gift. So what you saw with the cherubim looking down at the mercy seat and the blood, the cherubim represented the righteousness and justice of God. Or in other words, God's integrity or holiness. Meaning that when the blood was sprinkled there, it was a picture of Christ's death on the cross, which is said to propitiate or satisfy the Father's demands, holy demands, which required that our sins be judged. So Christ went in our place, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, John, Baptist, John the Baptist said. John 1, 29. He was alluding to the, the Lamb that was sacrificed in the tabernacle. And Christ was that Lamb, so the Lamb of God, without spot or blemish, which means he was sinless. So that uh, blood, when they looked down on the, on the blood of the, 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 uh, the mercy seat, the blood on the mercy seat, sprinkled, sprinkled there by the high priest, we see that the, the cherubim looked down and it, we said to, God was said to be satisfied, meaning that satisfied his holy demands, which required that sin be judged. But Jesus Christ, uh, he was the high priest, and he didn't sprinkle the blood of another animal. He used his own death, which is uh, the, the death of Christ on the cross, his spiritual and physical deaths, is noted by the expression, his blood, which is a representative analogy of the spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross. So that's speaking of propitiation. Paul talks about that in Romans 3.25, this mercy seat. So the ark was transported, as, as we'll see, by, two means, uh, by means of two gold-covered poles run through two gold rings on each side from which they were not to be moved unless it might be necessary to remove them in order to cover the ark when the tabernacle was moved. Now listen to me. Upon the lid or the mercy seat or at the ends of the ark, as in the temple were placed the cherubim, probably figures which were beaten out of gold, as was the lampstand. So here's another picture uh, you ha- should have in your possession. The picture of the ark, it's a picture somebody uh, tried to construct the ark according to the dimensions that prescribed here in Exodus. And we see that there's the cherubim. Uh, they have look like kneeling, these two angels, these two cherubim. They actually were probably standing here. But you get a good idea. You see the gold border? You see the border, so the lid, uh, things wouldn't slide off like the the uh, the uh, 
the bowl of incense that would be put on there. But that's, you see we're in between the two cherubim? That's where the blood would be of the animal would be sprinkled on the Day of Atonement by the, the uh, high priest in Israel. And there's the, uh, the poles. Remember, they, they, had a, they were made of acacia wood overlaid with gold, and so were the rings that the, the poles were put through. So they, this is how they would carry the ark. And it was interesting. There was a certain uh, Levitical priest had a, a certain group of uh, Levites that had to carry the ark. It was interesting. Remember King David? He wanted the, the, the ark got taken by the Philistines, and then he wanted to bring it back. But uh, and he, so one of the guys tied, uh, tried to, it was, was starting to fall, and the guy tried to catch it, and God killed the guy. Well, the whole thing was done wrong by David because he didn't follow God's instructions. So later on, we read that he did transport the ark, but he did it in a way that would be pleasing to God. So that's telling us that God has a protocol, and he wants to be worshipped the right, the certain way, under the filling of the Spirit, by means of spirit and truth. You can't have fellowship with him if you if you're, have sin in your stream of consciousness, and you're living in that sin, you have to confess it and then obey what he has prescribed in the word of God. So in shape, these cherubim were probably human, <clears throat> as, it, as it appears in this particular picture, with the exception of their wings, though some authorities think that they were of the same complex form as the cherubim mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, they were no doubt <clears throat> the normal or full height of a man. So these cherubim would be about the height of a guy like myself. Uh, around that, around a uh, 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 height of a man, and so that's what the size of these cherubim would be, and they were always spoken of as maintaining an upright position. That's why I say that they look like they're kneeling down in this picture, but they actually were standing erect in the uh, act in actuality. We know this because of what Second Chronicles three thirteen says, and also they stood facing each other, looking down upon the mercy seat with their wings forward in a brooding attitude, just as we read. Now the golden censer with which the high priest once a year entered the most holy place was also would be put on this lid. And I'll, I'll show you that altar of a golden censer in a minute. Now the ark contained, what did the ark contain? I'm going to show you a picture in a moment of what was actually in the ark. In the ark contained two tab tables of stone on which the Lord wrote the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> or in other words, uh, we could say Moses, the ones Moses prepared, from the original broken by him when he heard of Israel's idolatry. Now the ark also contained, along with the Ten Commandments, it also contained a golden jar of miraculously preserved manna. Okay, that's what the other item. And the third item was Aaron's rod which budded. It's a picture of Christ in resurrection as well. The manna, Jesus Christ, is the bread of life. All these things are speaking of Jesus Christ. They're visual aids and aid the people in understanding about their future Messiah, who's promised to them all the way back uh, to the Garden of Eden with Adam and the woman. And the seed, your, your seed, the, woman, the woman's seed, would crush the serpent's head, and he would, he would bruise him on the heel, your seed, speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, the, uh, there's the, uh, if you look at the picture, <clears throat> you see uh, 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 the, t the Ten Commandments would be written on two tables of stone. They would be in the ark, and also you see Aaron's rod that budded there. And also you would see uh, the preserved manna. And then there was a bowl there, the, or the, the golden censer, which was also put on the lid of, the, of the, uh, the ark at times. Now the materials, contents, and the employment of the ark of the covenant were significant, as I've been trying to bring out. In its materials, the acacia wood and the gold, the ark was a type of the humanity and deity of Christ. <clears throat> the ark portrays the Lord Jesus Christ in hypostatic union as the God-man. In other words, he's undiminished deity and true, uh, true sinless humanity and one person forever. We had a big series on the person of Jesus Christ and the fact that he has two natures, the Bible teaches us. We talked about how the two natures, the divine nature and the human nature, uh, are, are, uh, interact with each other, how they, how we, uh, how they are... Um, they're, uh, they're, they're, how one functions with regards to the other. We saw that Jesus Christ has only one will. He doesn't have a human will because he was, he's a person. What you saw was Jesus Christ veiling his deity with a human nature. That's what, and that's what the gold is speaking of. Uh, the gold is speaking of the deity of Christ, and the acacia wood is actually a picture 
of Jesus Christ's human nature. So the ark, again, it portrays the Lord Jesus Christ as the God-man. It's telling the Israelites, this is what the Messiah is going to be like. And acacia wood was interesting. Uh, You wonder why they used acacia wood. Well, acacia wood grew in the desert. And that fittingly portrays Jesus Christ's human human nature as a root out of parched ground. Uh, If you look at the picture, this, this is a great picture. This is an acacia, this is acacia tree. This is where they get the acacia wood, very strong wood. It was found in the desert. And what did it say in Isaiah 53, 2 about Jesus Christ? He would be like a root out of parched ground. Hold your place. Look at Isaiah 53, 1. Isaiah 53, 1. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. One of the great chapters in all the Bible. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 1. So this acacia wood, the ac- that, tr- that tree where she came from, grew in the desert. And so this is a fitting picture of Jesus Christ who is said in Isaiah 53, 2, to be like a, a root out of parched ground, which is what the, the, the acacia, wood, uh, acacia tree is basically a root out of parched ground. It's something growing in the middle of nothing that's deserted. Look at Isaiah 53, 1. It says, Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, speaking of Jesus Christ, grew up before him, the Father, like a tender shoot, and then look what it says, and like a root out of parched ground. So it's t- that's, that's a picture of the, the, the acacia tree from which we get the acacia wood, which helped to compose the ark. And the ark was a picture of Jesus Christ. Now you can go back to Exodus 25, please. Exodus 25, please. Now, the fact that the ark was overlaid with pure gold suggested deity and manifestation. Gold was the metal that represented deity, and deity manifested. So what it's telling us is that the ark is telling us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, deity, manifested himself 2,000 years ago. So the ark was is all portraying that about Jesus Christ. He manifested God to men because he is God. And we see here that he was always God. He was from, before Abraham was, I am. He has no beginning and no end. He is, his preexistence is from eternity past. He is equal to the Father and the Spirit. Deity was represented by gold. And the acacia wood spoke of his humanity. And the, again, that wood, the acacia tree, it grew out of parched ground in the desert. It was found in abundance in the desert. So the employment of the ark, particularly the mercy seat, would typify the divine throne. Remember I told you, the tabernacle is a picture of heaven. There's a throne there. The throne in the tabernacle, that mercy, that, that ark of the, uh, the ark of the covenant, it had a mercy seat. That's a picture of the throne. And remember I told you before, in heaven, it used to be a throne of judgment for people like us, sinners. But because of the death of Christ, it is now a throne of grace. That's why it says in Hebrews 4, 11, uh, 4 14 through 16, that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Why? Because of the death of Christ. And the death of Christ was typified or pictured with the blood of the animal that used to go, that would be put on that, the mercy seat, on that lid of the Ark of the Covenant. So this we see here is that this mercy seat was the, uh, it, it was a picture or typified the divine throne in heaven. It was transformed, as I said before, from a throne of judgment to a throne of grace as far as the sinner in Israel was concerned by the blood of the atonement that was sprinkled upon it. Uh, hold your place. Uh, go to Hebrews again. You remember where Hebrews is. We were there earlier. Book of Hebrews is, you have to know your Old Testament to study Hebrews. Otherwise, you're not going to understand it. So one day when we do study it, and we will, We'll be ready because we've studied Genesis, Exodus, and other passages, other Old Testament books. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Look at verse 14. Hebrews 4.14. It says, therefore, Hebrews 4.14, therefore, since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus Christ, who has passed through the heavens, his, resurre- his ascension into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus, the Son of God, 
And here's a passage you might say to the, the Jehovah Witnesses, who, by the way, Jehovah Witnesses, they don't believe in the, uh, was it, the Mormons? They don't believe that Jesus is equal to the Father, that he is actually deity. It says right here that he's God. Jesus, the Son of God. You can't even be any more explicit about that. So when you saw Jesus, that human being, 2,000 years ago, you were looking at God. His deity was veiled by his, fle his uh, human flesh. Now listen to me. He let it out a little bit with the transfiguration in Matthew 17. His garments showed like nothing of this world, and he was giving them a glimpse of his glory. When we see Jesus Christ, for instance, if the rapture were to come today, or our death, we would see Jesus Christ full manifestation. 2,000 years ago, he veiled that deity often. He veiled the deity, but when we see him after, at our death or the rapture, whichever comes first, we're going to see him as he really is. And that's why you read Revelation. Revelation 1, John, even though he was Jesus' best friend, he bowed before Christ because Jesus was letting him see his deity. And it, he describes what he looks like in Revelation, which is pretty astounding. So I don't think anybody will be putting an arm around Jesus when we get to heaven. I think all of us pretty clearly will be bowing before him and we will be worshiping him, just like John did. But look at it says in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, yet without sin. Now look, he says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to what? The throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's speaking of prayer. So the only reason why you and I can go into the Holy of Holies while we're in prayer See, when you're in fellowship with God, in prayer, you're in the holy of holies of heaven. You're in the holy of holies. You're in the most holy place. And the only reason why you and I can go there when we pray is because of the blood of Christ. The death of Christ has made it possible for you and I to enter the most holy place, the holy of holies and the most holy place, and to offer up prayers at the throne of grace. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's so beautiful, the tabernacle and everything that's in it. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Now, the cherub, uh, this blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. You can go back to Exodus 25, please. The blood sprinkled on the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement typified, it's a picture or portrays, we could say, the spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross, both of which propitiated the holy demands of the Father. Now, the cherubim with outstretched wings, as we saw, guarded the integrity or holiness of the mercy seat. Therefore, the cherubim typified the integrity of God, which cannot compromise with sin, people, but has been perfectly dealt with and satisfied by the voluntary substitutionary spiritual and physical deaths of Jesus Christ on the cross, which tip was typified itself by the blood of the animal. Now, the ark was the commencement, people, of everything in the tabernacle symbolism and was placed in the Holy of Holies, and in particular, the most holy place. Remember I told you the, the, uh, the holies, holies had two compartments. One, the, the only article of furniture was the Ark of the Covenant. The very next room, the ver right then there was a, with the Ark of the Covenant, as we saw, if you saw that, if you can look at that picture that we showed earlier, look at that picture I showed you earlier. Where has the, ar the altar in the courtyard? But if you notice, there was a veil that separated the room where the Ark of the Covenant was. If you, uh, the veil is, is depicted by number three. If you look at the number, it's a number three, and the number three is in the Holy of Holies. That's the veil. The veil separated the room where just the Ark was, that's the most holy place, from the other room, uh, where it, which had the altar of incense, the lampstand, and the table of showbread. Okay? So the veil is a picture of Jesus Christ's human nature. When he died on the cross, what happened to the veil in Herod's temple? It got torn from top to bottom. That's saying that the way into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, has been accomplished through Jesus' death on the cross, through the death of the sinless human nature of Jesus Christ in hypostatic union. So we see that the ark again was the commencement of everything in the tabernacle symbolism and was placed in the most holy place of the Holy of Holies, showing it's telling us something, that God begins with himself in his outreach toward man in Revelation. While on the other hand, 
In the human approach, the worship begins from without, moving toward God to the very center of the most holy place. So just as you look at that picture, I brought this out before. In the east end, this is interesting, in the east end of the tabernacle, the entrance curtain, if you see it, show me that you get the right picture. Beautiful, good. Okay. So in the, in the, where it says the entrance, opposite where the Holy of Holies is, you entered there. That's a picture of us, the sinner. But before we could get to the Holy of Holies in the most holy place, what do we run into? The brazen altar. That's the picture of the cross. So we can't come to the Holy of Holies and have fellowship and a relationship with a holy God unless we come with a sacrifice. That's why it says in Hebrews 9.22, alluding to this, that no one can approach God where there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And what did the animal the shed of the blood of the animal picture of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. John the Baptist said he's the lamb of God. His, the, lamb, the blood of the lamb, speaking of death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So man, as we'll say, as we've seen, begins at the bronze altar. That is the cross where atonement is made in the light of the fire of God's judgment. Now Exodus 25.10 says that the ark was to measure two and a half cubits by one and a half cubits. Now the cubit if you look at Exodus 25.10 again, it says, Exodus 25.10, you can go back there if I haven't told you already to do so. Sorry about that. Exodus 25.10. It says, They shall, the Israelites, shall construct an ark of acacia wood two and a half cubits long, that's three feet nine inches, and one and a half cubits wide, that's two feet three inches, and one and a half cubits high, two feet three inches high. So, we see here that, what's a cubit? Now the cubit is, in this, is the Egyptian royal cubit, which was approximately 20 inches in some change. And it was the common estimate for the cubit. Uh, and the common estimate for the cubit was 18 inches. So in other words, the way they would do it is you, a cubit in, the, in, that, in Moses' day was the distance from the tip of the man's middle finger. So my middle finger, the tip of my middle finger, okay, to the end of his elbow. So this, the very end of my tip of my middle finger to my elbow, that was considered the cubit, about 18 inches. Now, that's approximate, okay? But that's where they would get this cubit. So we see here, verse 12, if you look at verse 12, verse 12 says, you shall cast four gold rings for it and fasten them on its four feet and two rings shall be on one side of it and two rings on the other side of it. So verse 12 is making clear that the ark was not to touch the ground because it, could, it would have... Uh, and since it would have feet, and only the bottom of the feet could touch the ground. So the feet had rings attached to them, as we see. One ring protruded to the side from each of the feet. And this was so, uh, so a gilded acacia wood pole could be run through the rings on each side, according to verses 13 and 14. If you look at verses 13 and 14, you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the, whole, the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. Now, I gave you a picture, which is actually the best picture of it. Um, yeah, the, the picture, it's a, it's a, a picture of a, the cherubim, and they look like the cherubim are kneeling. No, the other one, the one after it. Uh, not the cartoon thing or the, the illustration. That's the one. Okay, yeah. So if you notice the poles and the wood, the, how they run through the gold rings, that's what we're talking about in verses 13 and 14. That's how they looked, okay? So it had to be carried. So the ark was lifted up by the ends of the poles and was transported in this fashion. Now the special quality of the ark was protected by having the rings in the feet and not in any other part of the ark. Thus only the feet would be scratched when they moved it. The poles were to remain in the rings of the ark to minimize the possibility of damage as well as wear and tear to the poles. Now, that first one that you had, Tony, the other, the one that's almost like a, an illustration, not a picture. There's another picture of the Ark of the Covenant. It looks like, you know, the cherubim look like lions there. See that one? Yeah, that's at the very, yeah, the very, the last one. Okay? So that's another artist's rendering of the Ark of the Covenant. But you notice the poles? So we see here, the, the other one, it had them on the sides. Here it looks like it had, they have them underneath so what we see here is all that being said we got a, a, a pretty good picture of what the ark looked like now the ark symbolized 
it, uh, first of all, we, we already mentioned that it was a picture of Jesus Christ, right? But the ark also ultimately sends this, this message to us. It symbolizes God's presence as well. God is present with the Israelites. This Ark of the Covenant would tell the Israelites that God was present there. So the Ark symbolized God's presence as well as his holiness, as we've pointed out, and in addition, his covenant blessing upon the Israelites who were to respect this symbol, which portrayed the reality of God's presence. That's why when David tried to transport the Ark and take it away from the Philistines after he took it away from the Philistines, and he tried to transport it, and he didn't do it the way God prescribed, David showed a disrespect for God, and he killed the guys who did it. And David thought God was too severe, but God told David, you're wrong. I want, I'm, I'm severe. These are my rules, which is another thing David had to learn, and we all need to learn. We got to go by God's rules, which leads us back to what we talked about before, religion. Too many people are going, and Christians we're talking about, are trying to worship God any old way they want. And God doesn't prescribe that. People are going, praying to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, not following the protocol of the scriptures. Jesus said to pray to the Father in his name by the power of the Spirit. There's a protocol. There's only one way to get saved, through Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ, not to Allah or any other son of a gun out there who thinks he's the Messiah. No, only through Jesus Christ. And we're to fellowship with God. We have to confess the sin and obey him. Don't think, don't think anything else we try to do. If we don't follow those procedures for fellowship, confess the sin and obey him, you can sit there and put on a great show like a lot of people do in Christians today. It's all hypocrisy and it's rejected by God and he's disgusted with it. It's called dead works. That's why you hear me mention this. It's so important to be in fellowship because whatever we do, if we don't do it while we're in fellowship with God under the power of the Spirit, meaning in obedience to God's word, he won't accept it, any good works that we do. In fact, they're not really good. They're dead works, as it says in the book of Hebrews. So I, very important that we understand what God keeps t- is telling us. He told David this. He taught David this. He's teaching the Israelites this in Exodus 25. You've got to worship me according to how I want to be worshipped and not how you feel or what you think is the right way. Very important. So the... Can't come on Easter Sunday and write a big check then and be saved. That, yeah, some people... Yeah, exactly. They write, yeah, they think their money can buy God. Yeah. So the ark not only had a symbolic value, but also a practical value as well. How so? Well, it held something extremely important. Does anybody, anybody remember what we just said that was in the ark? What was in the ark? The three things. Anybody remember? Aaron Staff. Aaron Staff butted, yeah. What was on the stones? Very good. And what was the other thing? It was a bowl. Yeah, that bowl. Yeah, but it was another thing. No. The blood was... Manna, right. So Billy got the, 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 the commandments. Tyler's over there with the bread. And the show, uh, the uh, the bride that budded over there with uh, Tony, which uh, so what was in there? What was in the in the, in the uh, that was a practical value to the Israelites? The Ten Commandments were in there. The Shekinah. It's also interesting as we close. I want to wrap this up here, and we could talk on. I could teach on this all day long, people. Okay, <laughs> this is you could go all day long. There's so many things on this. We could do topical studies off this whole thing. Isn't it a shame that the book of Exodus is not being taught enough out there today? It's really a shame. It's so many things we've been learning. Well, the Shekinah glory, remember who that is? That's Jesus Christ, the Shekinah glory. Well, the Shekinah glory appeared in the tabernacle in Israel. Now, between the cherubim was the Shekinah glory, the cloud in which the Lord appeared above the mercy seat. See, he would appear to Moses, and he would appear in between, in between the ark of the, the two cherubim and the ark of the covenant on the mercy seat. He would appear there in the tent of meeting to speak with Moses. So it was uh, between the cherubim was the Shekinah glory, the cloud which the Lord appeared above the mercy seat. It was not the cloud of incense, but the manifest appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ of the divine glory. The Lord manifested his essential presence in this cloud. Therefore, no unclean and sinful man could go before the mercy seat. This is one of the reasons why there has to be a hell. There has to be a... And because God's holy. And if you're not going to approach him based upon what he prescribed, the death of his son, there's no other place for you. In fact, 
God wouldn't be holy if he didn't judge sin like that and judge sinners like that who rejected his son. And so we see there that it's so important that we understand that God is holy. That's where his presence was in, the, in Israel. That's what he would manifest his presence between the two cherubim above the mercy seat. So the Lord, uh, the Lord manifested his essential presence in this cloud. Therefore, no unclean or sinful man could go before the mercy seat. Not even the anointed high priest could go before it of his own pleasure people or without the blood of the sacrifice or he would be killed by the Lord instantly. We're going to find out later, and I think it's numbers. Aaron's two sons get killed by the Lord because they offered up strange fire. Why? They were not worshiping the Lord and doing the things they were supposed to do in the tabernacle, and they didn't have any respect for him, and so he belted them one. He killed them. See, God is our Heavenly Father. He disciplines his children, unlike a lot of earthly parents who don't love their children by not disciplining them. God loves us. And he will discipline us if we decide we're not going to do things the way he prescribes and try to worship him in a fashion other than he's prescribed. Now, what's that? Yeah, he's a, he's a father we must respect. Now, that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that he doesn't love us. He does love us. But we like to define God's love with our goofy human love, which is goofy and a lot of times lacking discernment. No, God loves us affectionally, but he also, his, uh, the, greatest, uh, uh, the greatest demonstration of love for God is our respect for him, actually. So when we, uh, God's trying to teach Israel to have respect for him. Now, I want to show you one more thing. If you look at the, uh, if you look at, the, and then we'll close. If you look at, uh, if I can find the, the thing. Okay, here we are. Look at verse 21. He says, you shall put, Exodus uh, 25, 21, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. So it was like a lid. And remember, it had borders, right? And the ark, you shall put the testimony, which I will give to you. There I will meet with you, fellowship. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So the word testimony there, it's referring to the Ten Commandments. And the word identifies the Ten Commandments as the witness or the affirmation of God's commandments belonging to his covenant with Israel and also express God's will and the duty of the Israelites. So why is it called the Ten Commandments the testimony? Again, it's, they're called the testimony because they're a witness or the affirmation of God's commandments belonging to his covenant with Israel and also express God's will and the duty of the Israelites. Now, the mercy seat. That word is kaporet. Is it, somebody have a, a phone there ringing? What is that? Oh, really? Oh, okay. So the uh, mercy seat is the kaporet in the Hebrew. And the mercy seat was a covering over the ark. And it was a lid on top of the ark. And it was the place where sins were forgiven because the blood was sprinkled there between the two cherubim. And it was the same size as the ark itself, as we saw in pictures. And it was made of acacia wood overlaid with gold. And Paul alludes to this in Romans 3.25. When he uses the term mercy seat in Romans 3.25, he's speaking of the fact that Jesus Christ is, a, the mercy seat is a picture of him. And that word in the Greek, that's translated propitiation in Romans 3.25, it says that Jesus Christ was a propitiatory gift, meaning he was a gift from the Father to pay for our sins, to satisfy his holy demands, which required that our sins be judged. So the mercy seat is alluded to by Paul in Romans 3.25, and he speaks, of it, uh, he speaks of the mercy seat as a picture of Jesus Christ, as a gift from the Father sent for our sake to satisfy the demands of his holiness, which required that our sins be judged. That's propitiation, satisfaction of God's demands, holy demands. So this is a great picture of the ark. And the, uh, the, uh, we just begin to look at the uh, tabernacle. We just look at the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle this, uh, this week. Next week, we'll continue to move further out, uh, out, of, the, out of the most holy place, now into the, further into the holy of holies, and then out to, ultimately into the courtyard 
we're going to learn a lot of different things about the tabernacle. So hopefully you enjoyed the class. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the things, the wonderful things that you showed to us, showed to us today in the teaching of the Word of God by the power of the Spirit about your, the person of your Son and about heaven itself through the tabernacle and about ourselves and the church that we're all, a, the tabernacle is a picture of all these things and typifies all these things. We thank you for the things that you've been teaching us through your word today in Exodus and other passages of scripture. And we pray that these things would help us to uh, motivate us to become more and more, uh, more and more uh, intimate with you and to be more and more obedient to you and loving you with all our entire being and our neighbor as ourselves. We just pray, Father, that this class would build up and edify the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to you and your son, Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone who, has, who hears my voice that has not believed in Jesus as, as their Savior, I'm here to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. For the Father did not send the Son into the world, but to judge the world, to judge the world, but to send his Son into the world to save us. So God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish, but have eternal life. For this Father did not send in the Son in the world to judge the world, but this, that the world might be saved through His Son. So if you can say now to the Father in your own words that you're believing in His Son, Jesus Christ. And to do this means an acknowledgement that you're a sinner and Jesus is the Savior. And if you do that, if you do trust in Jesus as your Savior, you have eternal life and the forgiveness of sins and you now can, are been entered into the Holy of Place through the death of Jesus Christ. And if you choose to reject Jesus Christ, which is God's will is that you be saved, he desires all men to be saved. However, if you have a volition and you could say no to this, and I'm here to warn you and to tell you that to reject Jesus Christ as Savior would result in eternal condemnation. Now, that means that you will consciously suffer in the lake of fire forever and ever. It is that terrible. And we also meet, must understand this is taught in Revelation chapter 20. Where in Revelation 14, that the, when Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, the false prophet and the beast, the Antichrist, who are human beings, are still there. And, they, and it says that they'll be tormented day and night. And this is terrible. But this is, the, this is the side of God that we must respect and fear. That's the side of his holiness. So God loved us, and he gave us away through his son so we can avoid this eternal condemnation conscious torment night and day in the lake of fire he gave us his son so that we could live with him forever the choice is yours so this is not a game and this is something that you should be seriously considering and you might not have another two minutes to live you could drop dead right where you are so don't mess around with god and don't play games with your soul this is choices now and it's serious so the choice is yours believe in the lord jesus christ and you should be saved and failure to do so will result in eternal condemnation. My prayer, and we know it's the Father's will as well, is that you would trust in Jesus Christ and live with God forever in eternal bliss and serving and worshiping Him in the presence of all the elect angels and the church and all the regenerate throughout history. Thank you, Father, for these things that we've learned this morning. We pray again that the class will be a benefit to the body of Christ and bring glory and honor to you and your Son. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to take up a Sunday morning offering. <clears throat> and we're going to sing a song called I Dig Your Love. <laughs> and that's on page 73. I Dig Your Love. All right, let's pray for this offering. Father, we pray that this offering would be given out of proper motivation, out of love and appreciation for you and your son, Jesus Christ, and for the body of Christ, and for the teaching of the word of God here. We know by giving to you, we, by giving in this offering, we're giving to you, and this ministry is simply an, uh, an expression of your, your love. And we just pray, Father, that our needs would be met. We thank you for the people who have taken part in giving. We pray that the, this offering would produce many thanksgiving toward you and meet our needs, and also be a blessing to those who give, because your son taught it's more blessed to give than to receive. So pray, Father, again, we pray for this offering in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Okay. I dig your love, page 73.
No, that's me on guitar. So you got a break. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hey, Tyler, give me a little reverb. Thank you. All right, here we go. I dig you love, page 73. Precious son, even though I was your enemy, you raised me with your son and seated me up in the heavens. I'm in Christ by your grace. I sing in praise for all that you done to me, Dad. your love and seeking out this lost and wicked sinner when I was dead in sin you gave me life love and happiness I'm redeemed justified sanctified soon to be glorified yeah Thank you.